By now, you've probably heard of the Silicon Valley bank filling, either from our newsletter last week or from just waking up to it this morning or reading the news of the weekend. There are many unknowns with this most significant bank failure since the 2008 crisis. And now a second bank in New York has just been shut down this morning as I'm recording this video, which is on Monday. Now, I'm going to explain what we know, how it could affect you moving forward, and what you should be watching for in the next several days and weeks. Your inclination might be to dismiss this because, after all, you may not have much or any money in liquid cash over $250,000, money invested with venture capitalist or cryptocurrency, but you might want to rethink that position. This fallout could have broad implications far beyond just Silicon Valley or New York. I'll also announce a winner of last week's giveaway, and I'm going to tell you how to enter this week. So let's take a look at what you need to know. What happened? I'm going to try to explain this as simple as possible, avoiding too much technical gargan so you can really see what happened here. In a nutshell, Silicon Valley Bank attracted venture capital firms, tech businesses, startups, and CEOs and officers of these businesses by offering them a high annual percent yield on their accounts. As the market goes, it wasn't incredibly high, but it was enough of an incentive paired with their flexibility for startups that they had $342 billion in client funds. 74 billion in loans and 212 billion in assets. Now, SFV maintained a low level deposits on hand and invested a more significant percentage of its capital to try and pay for its high rates. So what they're doing is they're taking money from individuals and then turning around and investing it to try to pay back those high rates that they're offering their clients. All right, now to pay for these high interest rates, SVB had a solid amount of money in US Treasury bonds. And as the Fed raised interest rates, the bond value dropped. And this put SVB in a situation where they needed to raise over $2 billion in liquidity. And they fell short of that mark. And this caused many of their account holders to quickly go and withdraw and transfer their money out. Now, after SFB announced that it lost $1.8 billion on its asset sales, selling those bonds off at a premium, the bank failed to secure additional investment capital to make up the shortfall. And what this did is it caused many of their customers to, again, withdraw their money rapidly. That aggravated the balance sheets even further and then threatened the bank's solvency. So the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation stepped in and took control of the bank. Now, the Fed, to calm fears, they committed to make whole all of the depositors. This would be actual money in the bank. And the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or as we commonly know as the FDIC, is an independent agency created by Congress to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. The FDIC insures money in banks up to $250,000 per individual. And this bank, though, had a minimal number of accounts that were less than $250,000. Last year, only around 3% of the accounts were that lower dollar amount. And that means that 97% of the accounts last year were more than $250,000 at SFB. These weren't just ultra-rich individuals. Those large accounts were for startups, for business ventures and investment funds. These accounts covered everything from equipment and supplies to company payroll and retirement accounts. Now, a number floating around today indicates that about 89% of the accounts exceeded the $250,000 threshold. This indicates how much of a run was happening on this bank before the regulators stepped in and stopped transactions. Once that happened, the Fed announced that they would make whole the depositors and that funds deposited could be withdrawn starting Monday, today at the time of recording this video. So basically, if you had liquid cash in the bank, you could get it and then move it if it was the insured amount. Uninsured depositors will receive a receivership certificate for the remaining amount of their uninsured funds. And when the bank's assets are sold off, those certificates are paid to the extent that the assets are sold. So you see what I'm saying? If they had over $250,000 sitting in there, they would get paid the $250,000 by the FDIC, then the bank would have to sell the assets that they own and then try as much as they sell from those assets to pay the remaining balances. It won't necessarily be 100%. Or it may or may not. That's, that's the issue. It probably won't. And Sunday night, the U.S. government informed the SVB depositors that they'd have access to all the money deposited, even if the amount exceeded the $250,000 limit insured by the FDIC. More than half of the U.S. tech and life sciences startups banked with SFB. And many were concerned they wouldn't have enough even to you know, pay their employees this week or keep the companies running. And if the Fed had not aggressively taken the steps that it did before Monday morning, there would have been hundreds of businesses potentially going belly up this week. The Fed's rescue is for depositors, just depositors. The equity and the bondholders are going to be wiped out. So there will be a massive loss for many people. 
Trading of SFB Financial Group stock has been halted, but they had a market cap of $2.33 billion. That's going to impact investors, investment firms, and any funds that had equities in SFB. Hopefully, you followed all that with SFB. There's a lot of moving parts. The takeaway here is that a lot of money is still unaccounted for. This is going to have a significant impact, and we're far from being out of the woods here. The other significant bank failures you need to know about are Silvergate and Signature Banks. Now, two days before SFB, New York regulators moved in and closed Silvergate. The bank had heavy exposure to FTX. You probably heard a lot about FTX in the news several months ago. Their collapse took place over 10 days in November in 2022. Signature Bank was also heavily exposed to crypto. And one of their main products was Signet, which facilitated transactions from crypto to fiat currencies. The final thing to know without overcomplicating all this is that USDC, it's a cryptocurrency stablecoin that's pegged to the dollar. And stable coins are really a subset of the crypto ecosystem that investors can typically rely on to maintain a set price. It's where many crypto companies put their assets for stability. So what ended up happening is USDC is mainly held in six different banks. And three of those banks are, as you can probably guess, were the ones that ended up collapsing just over the weekend. Silicon Valley Bank Ranch, Silvergate, and Signature. And the federal government stepped in on Sunday to guarantee all deposits for SFB and Signature depositors adding confidence and sparking a small rally in the crypto markets today on Monday. Why does this matter? Most people watching this may just simply dismiss this because they don't have over 250,000 in the bank, nor do they have cryptocurrency, nor any account with any of these banks that just went under. But maybe you're not a venture capitalist, but there's still plenty of cause for concern. The full impact of these high profile bank failures remains to be seen. As I mentioned earlier, to pay the high yields, SFB had very little cash on hand from depositors to pay the high yields. They were heavily invested in multiple markets, especially startups and tech companies. If your 401k had a venture capital or emerging technology account you've been investing in with every paycheck, it could take a hit if that exposure was through one of these banks. If you work for a startup or tech company or any business which does business with a startup or tech company, transactions could be held up. Even if none of those you know, really fit your situation, you have to understand that anytime we're talking about billions of dollars transactionally slowing down, held up, or just evaporating, it can directly impact your bank and the overall economy. That big vault at the back of your hometown bank is likely empty. There's probably not really any money in there. And when you deposit a dollar, your bank might be loaning that out investing it or putting it into other accounts at other banks. It's not likely that any bank on the planet has cash on hand if all their account holders suddenly decide to close their accounts and withdraw their money. And you might say that, hey, taking your earned dollars and loaning it out to others in exchange for a highly modest interest return is sort of kind of a Ponzi scheme if the true bank ledgers were open. Banks, they borrow, they lend, they borrow, they lend, and then they lend again until the one dollar that you initially invested is really loaned out to possibly nine other dollars. And there's a lot of money on the books that doesn't have a corresponding one-to-one -one ratio of greenbacks. And that's a problem if the chickens ever come home to roost, as they say. Banking is really a confidence game. Basically, you have to be confident that your bank does not overextend itself. It doesn't leverage itself incorrectly or abscond with your funds. When people lose confidence in their bank, you see these mass migrations and people closing their accounts. And there's a real good chance that many banks and transaction systems are tied into one of these failed banks, which is why the Fed has stepped in so quickly this time, as opposed to the response time in 2008. They want to try to calm the market, assure people that their money is safe and avoid people making a run on their banks. Even so, you can bet that when the opportunity to close accounts at Silicon Valley Bank goes online today as it is supposed to, I can't imagine anyone leaving their money in that bank. These million and billion dollar shifts can dramatically impact markets in the overall economy. They hold up billions of dollars in deposits. The fallout is often only learned as the details get sorted out, as we find out how bad it is through one alarming headline after another. The Fed. First, there's an old saying that the Fed tightens until something breaks, and that something is assuredly these recent bank failings. So, it isn't very likely that the Fed's going to continue to raise interest rates as aggressively as they have in recent months. Given the hit to the economy, they're probably not going to want to pump the brakes any further. Initially, it looked like they would emerge from their meeting on the 22nd of this month with another big interest rate hike. And that's likely to be too big or at all at this point. 
When they announce rate hikes, it's mainly the rate at which banks can borrow money. And it's clear that with the bond market in decline and capital evaporating in certain sectors and taking significant shifts in other sectors, the Fed's not going to want to slow those processes down. They definitely want banks to remain solvent. And each one that they have to assist is another major hit to the economy, even when they have paid those banks into the FDIC program. Now, second, you're going to hear the term made whole quite a lot in the coming days and weeks. And that means everyone's going to get their money back. And for that to truly happen, though, SVB's assets need to be sold off. Only a few banks are large enough to do that, and they are not really buying into that ideal right now. No one's really taking up the, the Fed on the offer to buy this bank, at least at the time of recording this video. And that would mean a more protracted process of selling off pieces, which will draw this process out even further. Now, the subsidiary of SVB in Britain was sold to HSBC Holdings, a British multinational universal bank, for a total of one pound to avoid a complete meltdown in the startups and tech sector. What these hefty million and billion dollar moves do to the economy is to really erode confidence in banks, venture capital investing, and even long-term investments. When confidence is eroded, the economy begins to slow down as people really get super conservative with their spending. They start pulling their money in. And rightly so. There's a lot of reason to circle one's wagons and brace for impact. Now, we can't say with any absolute certainty the full extent of what they're referring to as a contagion really is going to play out to be. We can't determine with absolute certainty if the swift action by the Fed, the Bank of England, and the British government are really fast enough and deep enough to contain the spread of further failures. Each bank failure really sends ripples and shockwaves into the larger economic ecosystem. That's where it could have a dramatic impact in the coming weeks. We're already reeling from a global recession and global inflation, and this is only going to aggravate those further. If you're looking for a loan or line of credit in the near future, it's going to get much harder to obtain. The response will be politicians trying to stay ahead of this by proposals to regulate mid-sized banks, debates over the purpose and meaning of FDI insurance, and making investors whole, and lots of finger pointing and accusations, as is the norm. Right now, it doesn't really appear that this is going to equal to the meltdown of 2008 at the time of recording this video, but I mean, things could change within the next 48 hours. But it's going to deflate the economy and weigh on the economy for at least the rest of this year. One frightening part of the Fed move is that the government will allow banks to post collateral, mainly treasuries, as collateral to borrow against. Still, they will only be able to use the par value of the asset rather than the market value. And the idea is that this will create solvency for the banks, but it really introduces significantly more risk into the system, as there's really no guarantee that these treasuries will retain value, that yet the banks will willingly borrow against that risk. Now, in the aftermath of this fiasco, we also will likely see the FDIC limit raised significantly. The 250000 limit is enough to make you or me whole again, as they say, but it is insufficient for modern banking. The Fed, after all, directly caused this event by holding interest rates at 0% for so long and then just aggressively raising them kind of seemingly overnight. It has left at least a few institutions holding the bag, and we may still see another bank unable to recover even by borrowing against their own treasuries. And as we know, disasters, even economic ones, are usually not caused by a single event, but by a series of events that typically compound upon each other. I would encourage you to watch the news in the coming days for any more significant bank failures, and we will, of course, keep you posted in our newsletter and videos. With the Fed not expected to raise interest rates after this crisis, inflation may not be held in check. Raising interest rates is one of the Fed's only tools to keep inflation in check, so expect inflationary pressures to continue. Also, coming out of this, you might see some people moving to crypto and away from more traditional banking systems. Bitcoin was created to counter the 2008 financial crisis. Many people sought to pull their money away from conventional banking systems and get better control of their money through an electronic peer-to-peer -peer decentralized system. Whether this move will take place will remain to be seen because most people don't have much confidence there either, especially after the events of the last few years where the crypto market has gone down considerably. And considering also the high profile demise of several crypto exchanges in recent months. Giveaway. For this week's giveaway, we're going to be giving away a Survival Tab's eight day food supply. And to be eligible for a chance to win this in the giveaway, just simply post a comment below and click the like button. Next week, we're going to use a tool to draw a winner randomly from the comments of this video. Now, it's very important to note, I'm never going to reach out to you in the comment sections. I always get imposters. I go down there, try to tell people, hey, you've won. Just give us money for shipping. 
Uh, that's not me. I'm going to reach out to you via email if you're the winner. Just be sure that your email address shows on your About tab of your YouTube profile. And again, please ignore any comments that <laughs> saying, you know, from WhatsApp or Telegram because it's not me. I don't have uh, accounts on either one of those. For last week's winner of the Survival Medicine Handbook, the winner is a subscriber, Yelva Adina. And I'll reach out to you shortly to get that sent to you. So here's the thing. I'm not a financial advisor, but I can confidently say a few things. We can all expect that there will be a significant slowdown of the economy as everyone everywhere adopts a risk-averse conservative approach. And I personally know a few people that are making adjustments to their IRAs and 401ks to as conservative as an approach as possible. Now, at least for the moment, this crisis may have just barely been averted, maybe. But that doesn't mean banks will use their treasuries to bring their balance sheets into better order. And also, we don't know if we entirely dodge the disaster until we understand how fast the Fed makes depositors whole and how much exposure other firms may have had to these failing banks. The entire situation really remains very fluid and right now is literally changing by the day. We're going to continue to monitor this, but I would also uh, really suggest that you take a look at our free recession-proof guide. I'll post a link to it below. Even the small measures you can implement today will, I think, help you prepare against future financial collapses. Let me finish with a personal story. Um, I was debating whether to bring this up or not. In November, I shared that something kind of uh, challenging had happened in my life. I didn't really say in that video. Some of you probably don't remember. It was so long ago. Um, it was just something that had happened, and it was a financial impact that I had in my life. I'd make a, I'd made a pretty sizable investment. I'd sold a house years ago, and uh, I'd taken a lot of that equity, equity and invested it in a uh, investment portfolio that ended up going bankrupt. And I'm in this long process of trying to recover, you know, fraction of it. Who knows if I'll ever see that again? And uh, yeah, it was. I would say it's kind of, it was life-changing. Looking up one day and, you know, a sizable amount of money that you had worked hard over 10, 12 years accruing through the sell of a house and, you know, taking care of that house and then seeing it just, you know, you get scammed more or less. It feels like that anyway. Uh, watching this play out at SVB, SVB it feels very similar. Um, you know, seeing that just everyday people I, again, I know a lot of it was businesses, but there was a lot of people and there will be a lot of people severely impacted by this. So I take no joy in, in watching, you know, the old saying, misery loves company. I, for me, I don't, I don't want to see other people hurt the way I've been. It's, it's very, very difficult. And this leads me to another point. I've had several companies reach out to me in the last uh, six weeks asking me to uh, promote their financial products on my channel. And I've seen other prepper channels go ahead and decide to do it. And then, you know, they, this company has approached me and said, hey, we'll pay you X amount to promote our product. And it was a sizable chunk of change. It was not, <laughs> these people were coming in with some pretty significant numbers. And I bring this up because I was going to say something on the channel a while back, but I said, eh, you know, I told all the companies no. And the reason I told them no is because I watched several YouTube channels that I had respected at one time last year uh, financial channels that, you know, I learned some stuff from watching them over the years. They started to do the same thing. They started taking money from these uh, financial investment opportunities. And I know the size of those channels and the numbers they pulled down in views. And I know roughly how much they were probably offered. And it was, it was enough to, you know, it could have been someone's salary, how much they were taking each you know month. And I bring that up because I will never try... <laughs> Oh, I'm just not, I, I just, I'm never going to try to push a product on you to uh, solve your financial problems and, you know, investments. I've mentioned a few times, uh, a couple of, about three years ago at the beginning of the, you know, when everything was happening at the beginning of COVID, I brought up gold a few times simply as an option if people are interested. And I explained the pros and cons of it. Uh, there was a company I worked with that I have a high degree of respect for. And I, when I buy my precious metals, I go through them. But a Apart from that, you know, I just simply mentioned here is an option if you are interested in precious metals, and a lot of people in this community are. But again, I point this out as uh, as kind of an explanation that I, I always want to be careful with this channel, and please be careful when someone is selling you a financial product to offer, you know, that offers to fix your problems or is sounds like a sure bet. Because let's be honest, there are, <laughs> there are no sure bets at this moment. The only thing I know that I can personally do is take care of my household, make sure my food, water, energy, all these things, medicine are in order. Um, 
you know, I'm trying to grow this channel. So for me personally, that's where I'm putting my money is to reinvest into this channel. Uh, we are going to be taking on a few sponsors in the coming months. And I've been very, very skeptical of doing that in the past because I want to make sure that if I do pick up a sponsor, it always aligns with some product that I personally would use and that I see is bringing value to this community. And that's why, uh, you know, I get a flood of emails every morning, about 10 or 15 asking me, Hey, would you promote this? Would you promote this product? You know, whatever it is. And 99% of them, I just delete because I'm just very cautious what I bring to you. And I'm saying all that to wrap up this point is uh, in the coming months, just be careful, I think is my takeaway here, who is offering you what to solve your problems, especially on the financial note. Um, apart from the FDIC insurance that you may get in your account, you know, up to 250K, um, you know, just be careful is, is what I'm trying to say. Use wisdom and especially be skeptical if someone's coming to you with a financial product and they're taking money to promote that to you. That's massive conflict of interest. I know I said a lot there, but that's just my two cents. It's something that's been kind of weighing on me and I want to uh, show with the community. Again, I know there's a lot happening, but we keep doing what we do. We prepare. We'll, we'll get through this. Uh, this is going to be something I think we'll look back in a rearview mirror. It's going to be difficult, potentially, uh, how, however this plays out, but we'll get through it. As always, stay safe out there.